Hello. 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 Good morning. How are you guys doing? Sleepy? Do we need to take a break real quick? More caffeine? All right. Um, seriously, thank you guys for having me. It is an honor to be here and kick off uh, this next two days. Um, I'm confident that we're going to have a lot of fun together and learn a lot of new stuff and hear from some fantastic folks. Uh, this morning, I'd like to talk about uh, the centrality of design. Design is becoming way more central to the way that people perceive the products they use, the services that they pay for, and the way that they experience life. Technology is weaving itself into every aspect of our life, whether we like it or not. Um, and as such, I don't think that there's ever been a more important time for design to take the lead in shaping those experiences. Uh, quick little backstory on myself. Uh, in, geez, about five years ago, I started a blog called 52 Weeks of UX with a good friend of mine, Josh Porter. I was the principal designer at Twitter from 2010 to 2013. I am an advisor and a mentor to the Designer Fund, whose mission is to invest in startups co-founded by designers, build and educate design teams, and share best practices with the community. And more recently, uh, I founded and am now the CEO of a small little studio incubating new ideas called Habitat. Um, it's a highly collaborative environment, designers and engineers working together to use research and prototyping to explore new product ideas. I feel like I um, have a very unique perspective and I'm very fortunate to have spent the last seven years living in San Francisco, uh, working at a number of different companies, uh, as well as advising and mentoring others. There's been a tremendous shift in that time, and I wanted to share a little bit of that perspective with you guys today. I believe that there are bigger implications in what I've seen in San Francisco and in Silicon Valley uh, for folks that wor do work on the web and are creating digital products worldwide. The status quo used to be that design was a service and it was usually brought in at the end. It is a, uh, you know, a classic statement of putting lipstick on the pig. I'm, I don't know how many of you in this room have ever heard that or been in that uh, position, but it's not the most fun. Uh, it definitely doesn't lead to really great collaborative work, um, but sometimes you can still get some decent results. Fortunately, in the last, say, seven to ten years, we've seen a shift, and more specifically, in the last five or six, design having a seat at the table. And what does that mean? Well, uh, Today, venture capitalists are telling their uh, companies that they're investing in that the technology, their disruptive, innovative technology, isn't enough. That actually, it's the entire product experience that people are after. And if that's true, and design's kind of getting a seat at the table, then it sounds like we should be in charge. Uh, the irony is that even little babies get a seat at the table. And that doesn't actually accomplish much. Just getting to the table is not the end goal. Uh, there's a lot more work to be done, a lot less chips on the shoulder, a lot more collaboration, and truly working together. So let's dive in. Are you guys ready? Three people are ready. Is everybody else ready? <laughs> All right. So design has transformed from an afterthought to a prerequisite. People are tired of feeling like this when they use your product. People are really tired of trying to figure out how to print something. What they really want to do is feel like this when they're using your product. I, you're laughing, but it's true. Anytime you use some technology that actually kind of gives you that little sense of like, whoa, I got a superpower. Things are working. Now granted, there's plenty of times when things are not working and you don't feel this magical. But this is the goal, to have people who use this to accomplish something in their life and have a uh, net positive experience come out of it. That's how I want folks to feel when they use the things I create, and I hope you do too. 
Traditionally, uh, that type of thing, though, fell to the marketing department. If you wanted the user to feel like they had superpowers, you somehow had to convince them through print ads and commercials and all kinds of things and as many different channels as you could that if you use this product, you will be awesome. But recently, it shifted, and design is truly where that is falling to these days. To that end, we've seen a tremendous investment in design, especially in the technology sector. These are some of the more prominent mergers and acquisitions. So companies that were acquired for their design talent, for their uh, approach to building products and the way that they think about serving a customer. The interesting thing is that the vast majorities have ha uh, of these acquisitions happened in the last four to five years, uh, and it's only been accelerating. People are seeing the value of design and investing their dollars to infuse their companies with this kind of thinking and this kind of practical application. But it's not just studios, uh, it's the tools too. Pushpop Press was acquired by Facebook in 2011, and that team has gone on to help craft and create a number of the kind of core experiences in the Facebook product. Pixate and Form are both prototyping tools that were acquired by Google this last year. And even uh, just yesterday, InVision announced that they acquired Macaw uh, as a way of kind of bolstering their prototyping offerings. So you can see the value of design is only increasing and is only becoming more prominent. In 2014, the uh, Design Management Institute created this index. They, they believed that companies that were design-led or had a significant uh, designer that was in a role of leadership ended up creating a company that produced more value and they put that and tracked it against the S&P 500 and other stocks of other companies uh, that they were tracking and the crazy thing was it was an over 200 percent better return on investment and it turns out if you do things that are good for your product and they happen to be good for your shareholders everyone wins. One in 10 Fortune 100 companies have executive level positions for designers or designers who are uh, directly reporting into a CEO. This is an, a kind of incredible statistic to me that like out of the top 100 companies worldwide, 10 of them are, le are led in the executive level by design, whether it's Apple or GM, uh, IBM, Coca-Cola. I mean, even Nike has a CEO who is a designer. He started out in 1979 as one of the very first footwear designers at Nike and spent the next 30 plus years continuing to bring innovation to every area that he touched as he continued to grow uh, and, and manage more and more of the company until eventually he became the CEO. And I like to think that uh, this is what Mark would say if he was here. So in the last four years, We've seen 13 creative agencies acquired by tech companies. We've seen 27 startups that were co-founded by designers. And of those 27, five of them have raised more than $2.75 billion. To me, that is a significant milestone in the technology industry, but more importantly, in the design industry. Designers are, are moving past just the actual uh, product creation process and are moving into creating companies, designing companies. And those companies are creating immense value. As you can see, there's uh, a lot of uh, design in the DNA of these successful companies. Uh, Bridget Van Kralingen, who is the Senior Vice President of IBM Global Business Services, arguably a very large company, uh, she said there is no longer any real distinc distinction between business strategy and the design of the user experience. That's a quote that I would expect to hear from somebody uh, at a startup in San Francisco maybe, not from someone leading uh, the global business services product uh, for IBM. So as you can see, it, the user experience, the customer experience, the idea of design driving value that's focused on the user is spreading even to some of the largest companies in the world. And interestingly enough, in the last year, um, in Silicon Valley, where the venture capitalists all lined the rows of Sil Sand Hill, uh, six firms invited designers to become partners. They 
actually brought designers in to become venture capitalists, not just to identify companies that have a strong kind of design uh, quotient in their founding team, but also to apply some of their design thinking and design principles to the way that these firms are operating. I'm very fortunate that I, I know a handful of these six people and watching them transition into this area is, is kind of like watching a friend walk on a tightrope. You can tell they aren't quite sure exactly because it's a whole new arena. They're not used to necessarily all the investing strategy side of things. Uh, they're probably a lot more comfortable talking to the teams that are making the things, but they're having a broader impact. And because of these folks like these in these roles, you'll see more and more companies being invested in because of design being in the uh, kind of founding team and helping lead. Business schools in America uh, are embracing design. Uh, the top 10 business schools uh, for the last two years have had nine of 10 where business students are actually enrolling in design classes and or starting design clubs. It's becoming apparent to a lot of these folks that if they want to have a, you know, kind of a competitive advantage in the business world, design is the thing that they're looking at to give them that advantage. And then every once in a while, you have a CEO of a company that's not really known for design step forward and make statements like this. Larry Page, in 2011, when he took over as CEO at Google, said, our goal is to design everything so that it's beautifully simple. Now, I don't know about you guys, but uh, Google, to me, is kind of infamous for not really designing great things for a long time and for micro-optimizing, uh, you know, testing 41 different shades of blue to find out which one has a higher click rate. Um, but not trusting the designers to kind of create an overarching vision uh, for the product. So Larry Page makes this mandate, but he, he goes beyond that. He hires Matthias Duarte to come in and lead the design of Android. But secretly what was really going on was he was putting the things in place to uh, implement a organizational change that oriented the company around that goal of being a design-led company that made everything beautifully simple. And when you have CEOs who are willing to make statements like that and then hire the right people and then empower those people to connect with the rest of the organization and spread that message, you have a really, really powerful force on your hands. These guys also realized that uh, they're sitting on one of the greatest marketing uh, opportunities in the world, which is the interface of their products. Google released material design as a way of bringing some cohesion and a more unified user experience to uh, not only their own products, but also products that people are building on their platform on Android. What was interesting to me was not the color palette or the elevation of the button uh, that they recommend or the easing, easing function timings that they recommend. It was that they took this whole package and put it together and began to talk to the world about it, not just internally to themselves. Salesforce, another very large successful public company, uh, released the Lightning Design System last year and has gone on to talk about it, have folks traveling around the world, uh, kind of bringing their belief and their vision about design in, in, uh, within their company to the rest of us. And for me, when you realize that enterprise giants like Salesforce and Google are actually investing substantial amounts of time and money to market their design system, you know that we're in a fundamentally new era. So I'd like to go on and talk a little bit about design leadership. If we are in this phase where design is taking a little more responsibility for how products are designed and built and how the companies are formed that create these great products, we need to understand what role design can play in, that, in the leading of these endeavors. A great quote, that I love to use is that 90% uh, of the work of being a user experience designer is evangelism. And I'd say whether you're leading a project, leading a team, managing people, you happen to be the creative director or the head of design at your company, you know this is true. 
you will evangelize design's role. You will evangelize the methodologies and the processes by which you believe that the company can create the most successful products. You'll evangelize ways of working together amongst all the other parts of the organization that'll help keep, you know, moving your company forward. And the interesting part of this is the moment you feel like, oh my God, I finally, I got through to them. I finally did it. I've, I've talked to enough people in the company and everybody's finally getting what I'm saying. That's the moment that you've just started. You will continue to tell this story and tell this story and tell this story because you're helping people understand a new way of thinking. And it turns out if you're going to be doing that much talking, the words you use are important. The way that you present the things that you're trying to share is extremely important. A good story can be the primary vehicle for aligning an entire company around a mission. A good story can convey uh, even just the simplest moment in a product experience at a glance. And a story, a really good story, can end up actually serving as a decision-making framework for whether or not you're building the right thing. Another thing that you're going to spend quite a bit of time doing is reversing the stereotype. So unfortunately, uh, a lot of folks still think designers are uh, these eccentric, turtleneck-wearing, sitting-in-the-corner-in-the-dark emotional beings. I do know some of those. I have been that at times. <laughs> Um, and I think we all can uh, relate to that and understand why there's that stereotype. But it's interesting, uh, one of the biggest uh, investment firms in, in Silicon Valley started telling that their portfolio companies, if you want to hire the best designers in the world, those designers need to report to the CEO. And the CEOs all responded with, really? Because they believed that they actually, the designers just want to be left alone. They actually just want to go off in their corner and do their, their little artsy thing. They had no idea that design was interested in actually participating in the conversations around business strategy, around how you would actually develop a product going from early stage research all the way through to implementation. They, they just genuinely were surprised by this. Um, I don't know about you, I feel like I and many of my peers have been saying this for a long, long time, but uh, like I said on the last slide, you, you, the moment you think you've been talking about it is when you're just starting. So the, the thing that I really want to bring, though, when I'm out there evangelizing, when I'm reversing the stereotype, is I want the people that I work with to feel like this. I want them to feel invincible. I want them to feel like whether it's a meeting schedule or it's a bunch of backlash from uh, poor customer feedback or whatever it is that nothing can deter them. While we're working together in this way, they are invincible. And as a leader, I realized that I'm actually going to spend a lot of time doing this. I'm going to be like Space Ghost. I'm going to be fighting for the user. I'm going to be fighting for the design team to have the time and resources to do their job. At the same time, I'm going to be hyper aware of all the other parts of the organization that fit into that process and how we can be accountable to one another. And I'm going to be defending the process by which the right things get done to meet the needs of the user, but also supporting the goals of the company. And ultimately, I'm going to spend a lot of time, uh-oh, not having this work. <laughs> Uh oh, I'm gonna spend a lot of time doing this. <laughs> Keeping everyone in sync. You're gonna spend a lot of your day working with other people. You're gonna go out, you're gonna find the way to get everybody in the groove, get everybody working to the same rhythm, to get different parts of the organization to hear you and understand that the way that design wants to work is not incompatible with the way engineering wants to work, but instead, that we can actually find ways to be more effective together than we can by being siloed apart. So we've gotten to this stage. We're doing the Jay and Silent Bob. We've got everybody grooving. But you, you realize there's probably a little bit more to this than just doing the Jay and Silent Bob. So I want to continue this talk by diving into a few tips that I have for how to infuse a company with design. 
So maybe you're a solo designer at a small company. Maybe you're leading a design team at a large company. Hopefully some of these things will uh, be practical, tangible things you can go and take back immediately. And the first one that I love to talk about is sketching together. I have seen this work time and time again, whether it's at a company that I'm uh, currently employed at or it's a company I'm advising or some folks that I'm mentoring. Sketching together is the fastest way to get the disparate parts of your organization talking in the same language. If you don't believe me, go and sit down with the CEO and hand him a Sharpie and a piece of paper and ask him to draw the thing that he's trying to tell you about. In my experience, every time I've done this, we move faster into clarity and we get more uh, explicit about what we're trying to do and what we're trying to solve. We also move into a really visual way of communicating, but extremely low fidelity. So the barrier to entry is not that high. If I told the CEO that I need him to jump into Photoshop and make a comp for me, it's probably not gonna happen. But if I can give him the marker on the whiteboard or I can give him the Sharpie and we could start drawing together, this, this kind of dialogue begins building. And it's even better if you can involve other parts of the organization. I've seen folks from uh, research, I've seen folks from sales come in and actually start sketching ideas that no one else at the table was thinking about. Uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, the, the moment that uh, I gave one of the executives a red Sharpie. I don't know about you guys, but the red Sharpie is the most powerful tool in the world. When you hold the red Sharpie, you hold the power of veto. You hold the power of discretion and of identifying what is good and what is bad. Uh, and to be able to engage in a dialogue with some executives and having them draw and then drawing on their drawings and then letting them draw on your drawings and then giving them the red Sharpie to actually c circle the things that we need to, to pay attention to. Suddenly, you've given these guys a whole new power that they didn't know they had. And you've got the company thinking in a way that we can relate to and can help direct. Some of the most successful companies that I've seen that do a cultural investment of prototyping have this superpower, which is they have made design less precious. When the time it takes to design all the way through to perfection and then hand off for implementation and then build out a product only to look at it and go, oh, we didn't think of that. It's the worst experience. However, when you introduce prototyping into the way, uh, the way your company works, people start thinking in much more uh, loose, fluid, divergent ways. They start thinking that like, ah, actually, there aren't really wrong answers. It's more generative and it's more, what can we do? What is possible? Interactions usually baked into these prototypes and so you're having a conversation about a whole another level of fidelity that you don't get when you're talking about pictures of screens. We also happen to be in this great era where uh, prototyping uh, is what I like to call its awkward teenage years. <laughs> There's probably a new uh, prototyping tool every month, as far as I can tell. And the good part is, no matter the fidelity that you need, there's a tool that will support you and let you get that thing in the hands of the people who need it. Another really great tactic that I've seen is designing your meetings. Now, you may laugh at this, I know I did the first time somebody mentioned this to me, but it dawned on me that if you think about meetings as a design problem, they become a very different beast. They're no longer this dreaded, you know, giant room of people bored out of their minds, staring at their phones while one person's droning on about a talk or a, a PowerPoint slide with way too many bullet points that nobody can actually read. Instead, if you approach it as a design problem, you're already looking at the end result you'd like to see happen. You're designing the outcome you'd like to see. You are also introducing people to a design process without them even knowing it. Being observant and questioning things is a cultural phenomenon that I think is one of the most important things to encourage if you truly believe that your company should be design-led, should be, uh, or if it's, even if it's not design-led, it's infused with design. You want to encourage people to question things. You also want to encourage people to not take things 
offensively or react about it, but to be a little bit more scientific about it. It may be that someone who's not as uh, familiar with the inner workings of whatever you happen to be building uh, comes along and they ask one question that can fundamentally turn your, your perspective and, and help you see a new way of approaching a problem. Some of the best uh, product insights that I've seen in my entire career came from people that were not in the design team, that were not engineers, or actually people just using the product, paying attention, asking questions. Another really important key is this idea that uh, I totally stole from Lisa Reichelt, who is one of my favorite people. She uh, ran research and design at GDS for quite a while. She's now in Australia doing the same thing. Uh, if you can actually get the government to be design driven, I think you deserve a round of applause and we should probably pay attention to that. Um, and Lisa loved to say that there's no UX team, but that everyone is part of the user experience team. It's down to the entire company to achieve this. But that assumes that there's a prerequisite understanding that we've agreed that our goal is to actually create a great user experience for our customers. If we've done that, then everyone involved in the process is part of the UX team. No more supermen, no more solo people that are responsible for the weight of that uh, while I was at Socialcast, the company that I uh, worked at before Twitter, I was the director of user experience. And for a while, that really meant that the entire user experience was, it basically came down to me and the decisions I was making. And then one day it dawned on me that my title was director. And the last time I checked, directors direct a bunch of other people to do things. And so it became a mission of mine to get the engineers and the marketing folks and the sales team involved in thinking about our product and thinking about our customers in a way that we all felt responsible. So getting rid of the, you know, superhero, I can do all the things and really distributing that responsibility to the team is extremely critical. Finding alignment is truly one of the most important things, in, in my opinion, that I can do when I'm working with the various parts of the organization. My career felt like this a lot. I don't know about you guys. Uh, you get into a company and everyone's just got their head down. And you know what you don't see here is neither of these guys are malicious. They're not trying to ruin the other person's work. They're actually just so focused on what they're doing that they're oblivious to all the other things going on around them and therefore all kinds of friction. But when you can spend the time to bring alignment together between the various parts of your organization, you find that a lot of this disappears very quickly and an agreement to work towards a common goal allows alignment to start flowing through all the projects you're doing. Understanding the business and technical needs is something that I, uh, I talk to just about every designer that I can and encourage them to spend time doing. If you can't tell me how your company is making money on the product that you're designing, I'm probably worried about the design choices that you're making. If you haven't talked to an engineer to vet out the technical capabilities that your team has and what you can actually produce, then you are creating design solutions that may be impractical or totally infeasible. Apple was fantastic at this. Uh, from the beginning, they had the supply chain, they had this design team, they had this phenomenal organization. It wasn't just design, it was the whole of the organization. The uh, release of the iPhone 4S and I believe it was the iPad 2, um, Apple displayed what I think is one of the most beautifully designed business operations in history. They bought out all of the, the aluminum uh, in Australia, which allowed them to block Microsoft as a competitor. They created uh, a total demand for all the lasers. They just rented all of them that were needed to create this, uh, this new shell and these new products. And uh, they also controlled the supply chain around the metal chassis. So basically, from beginning all the way to finished product, they had controlled and designed the way to be in the best position possible to own the market at that time. And it wasn't just Johnny Ive's great phone. If it wasn't for Tim Cook's supply chain knowledge and them working together to create this seamless uh, product experience, I don't think Apple would be in the position that it is today. 
exercising restraint. Uh, Dita Rums is one of my heroes, and he always talked about less is more. Less, but better. Exercising restraint isn't just in the design decisions you make, though. Exercising restraint is in how you communicate with others. Exercising restraint in, in not over-scheduling and overburdening the team that you're working with. Exercising restraint is more a matter of being in character than anything else. And one of the last uh, and most important things that I think you can do is to demystify failure. Failure is only failure if you don't learn from it. But if you demystify it, if you take away the fear and the punishment that people expect if they fail, and instead create a framework by which you and your team can learn, you will encourage people to take more risks, culturally as well as practically in their work. When you do that, you create a process that can be repeated throughout other parts of the organization. And as design begins to interface with more pieces of the organization, hopefully we can bring this kind of a way of working into the rest of the company. If you care about people using your product as much or more than you care about your product, I believe you'll create something truly special. And it turns out that's a company that thinks about the user and the user's experience ahead of everything else. You'll probably also create a great business in the process. We're in a very unique moment in time. The value of design is clearer than ever. Companies are investing in foundational shifts across their organizations, and they're asking design to take a leading role. Let's not let it go to our heads. Let's try to take a chip off the shoulder or get rid of that feeling of like, we deserve this, but instead go in with a, a, uh, a way of operating that creates more trust, more honesty, more creativity, and hopefully more of what truly del delights the customer. So I'd like to leave you guys with one quote and uh, one last thought. Massimo Vignelli said, the life of a designer is a life of fighting against the ugliness. And when I first understood this, I understood it to be about beauty and about aesthetics. But beauty and aesthetics can be subjective. What I believe Massimo was truly talking about was the fight against the ugliness of process, the ugliness of friction, the ugliness of poor decisions not made in the benefit of the user, not in service of people who use your product. This is the fight that I fight every day, and I hope you'll join me. Thank you. <laughs>